we are live, as I say. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. So it's uh, awesome to be here at SODA. So I am, I, I guess I should clarify, I'm nominally the faculty advisor of SODA, and I do almost nothing. And it's not just because I'm lazy, it's because that SODA is such an amazing organization that they have become in 100% self-sufficient, like I, I, they don't need my input, they probably don't want my input because they already have awesome ideas and awesome events. Um, so I love being the advisor uh, for multiple reasons, A, because they're awesome, and B, uh, because they're completely self-sufficient. So uh, this is a fantastic organization. If you, you know, join them, go to their events, so do rocks. Um, so for those that don't know me besides of that brief intro. So I'm Adam McVeigh. I'm an assistant professor here in Cincy. I've been here for four years now. And um, a little bit about my background. So I did a equivalent of a four plus one that we have here. I did at UC Santa Barbara, so undergrad plus a master's. Um, while I was there, I got hooked up with some security research and competed in capture the flag competitions. And then after that, I said, I probably as some of you seniors in the audience, graduating seniors, only a few, wow. You guys are gonna be around for a while. Um, so yeah, so I, I said I'm done with academia. I cannot wait to get out of here, go get it. I mean, I had a job, I'm gonna go make tons of money. Um, I had a, a software developer position at Microsoft uh, in Seattle where I was a full-time software developer and I loved it, but I realized while I was there and I kept working on my research project part-time that what I really loved was research, uh, doing something new. So I went back, I left Microsoft after a year, went back to UC Santa Barbara and did their PhD program. Afterwards, I came here. Um, and so, oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, I think I made the right choice too. Uh, so, now I'd also like to introduce my co-host for this event, Will Gibbs. Will, stand up. So, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. You want to stand in front of the class? Uh, maybe. Or the group workshop? I don't know. I think in terms of classes, sorry. Group, okay. Well, hello, group workshop slash class. Uh, I'm Will Gibbs. I'm the president of Pwn Devils. Uh, unlike Soda, Adam helps us out a lot, which I really appreciate. Uh, not that they necessarily need to speak. Not that we necessarily, I don't know how to use the microphone. Uh, speak into it, but not too close. <laughs> not too close. Yeah, like right here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm the president of Pwn Devils. Uh, I guess I'll give a brief introduction to Pwn Devils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, so cool. Uh, sure, yes. Yeah, so uh, basically we're a club that participates and uh, or participates in Capture the Fly competition, CTS, uh, and we help you guys get up to speed as well. So. Uh, in our meetings, we work together and also uh, teach you guys how to exploit these binaries, how to uh, basically break them to either get a shell or get some sort of access or leak from uh, some system somewhere. Uh, and yeah, that's basically what we do. Cool. So I'll say something about so are there any freshmen in here who feel like maybe they know nothing or are completely overwhelmed and maybe even into juniors, seniors, slash above. Yes, we've all been there. We all start at the beginning, right? So Will started completely at the beginning. So he was a freshman who came to interview me as part of the Grand Challenge Scholar. Grand GCSB. Yeah, yeah Grand GCSB. Challenge Scholar. I never can remember the no, order yeah, of those words. Um, and he interviewed me as a Freshman didn't know anything, and just at the end, he's like, I really want to get interested in security. Um, do you know of anything that, that's like that here? And I was like, well, I you know, have this super informal hacking group called the Pwn Devils. We meet weekly, blah, 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 blah. I sent him all the stuff. He comes, starts attending our meetings, and within a semester or two, he was, I think it was after about a year, he came to me and was like, we should be a real student club, not just this informal group. Um, and so he, along with the other students, drafted the Constitution, elected a leader, which was Will, and he's been running it ever since. So he started literally where a lot of you are from no uh, security knowledge, not no knowledge at all, but no security knowledge, and he's now the president of the club helping me with this workshop. So this could be you, freshman, and he'll graduate at some point, so I need more people. Um, sorry. And 
the other thing that, that Will didn't mention, so we do meet, we meet Tuesdays and Thursdays um, for about two hours going over and improving our security skills so they compete in, usually these, the capture the flag competitions range from anywhere from eight hours to 48 hour competitions. And um, some notable results that I can brag about because I'm the advisor is uh, the undergrad. So we had a completely undergrad team play in this Seesaw CTF and they got 30th out of 240 teams. And in August last year, uh, we competed in this ACES CTF, which was super fun. Um, where all together, grads, undergrads, me, um, we were 24th out of 590, which was the second place uh, US team. So, uh, you know, we're, we're moving on up, uh, we're learning and getting better. So what we wanna do in this workshop, I wanna illuminate how code is actually compiled and executed. And unlike a lot of what I'm used to in a classroom, I don't just want to stand up here and talk, although clearly you can see I've already been doing that. <laughs> Um, it's going to be hands-on, so get a lot, get your laptops out, get your, I don't know, can you code on a t tablet? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Uh, get your smart watches, whatever you need. Uh, find a buddy if you don't have access to a laptop so you can pair attack and pair learn about these things. And we're going to look at really what it takes, we're going to look at the um, most common security vulnerability in binary is called buffer overflows, but to do that, we actually need to understand things. Um, and, okay, before we get, so there's two things we need to talk about before we get started. Avoiding jail. Does anybody want to be in jail? I hope no. I mean, if you want to be, there's very easy ways to do that, so I'm not gonna tell you how. Uh, you could, you're smart people in this room, you can find your way to jail if you desperately want to. Um, Avoiding jail, in, so I'm going to teach you some security stuff, and it's going to be very uh, easy to be like, oh, I should start testing my knowledge out on these, all these other systems, but uh, we don't want you to do that, and I don't want anyone in my classes or a workshop that I lead to go out and do bad stuff and be like, oh, well, Professor you know, Dupe said that this was totally fine. They taught me how to do this, so, and I can always point to the slide and be like, actually, I told them how to not do illegal things. So, um, uh, interject. Yes. You get to do bad stuff in CTFs. Yes. So, so capture the flags are great because they basically people let you hack their systems. So that's why they're super fun. Um, so don't do anything illegal in a hacking context. Context. This means never hack into a site or a system that you don't have permission. So let's say you're testing some stuff out and you find that there's a um, you find some security vulnerability in a program running on your laptop. Can you test that? No, why not? Yes, it's okay. You guys can talk. It's like a, you know. Because you don't own the program? Or you don't own the source code for the program? Ooh, interesting. Uh, I think there's a big, it depends kind of on your license of how you got that software, but most of those I believe are not enforceable for something like this. Um, and we'll actually be doing hacking where you don't necessarily need the source code. <laughs> so, is it illegal or is will it put you in jail? Why not? It's your computer and your program, right? So you bought the program, presumably, right? You purchased, you paid money for this copy of this program. It's running on your machine, and you're giving yourself permission to break into it. Now, if I find a vulnerability in a program and I notice that somebody in here is running it on their laptop and I launch an exploit against their program running on their laptop, is that legal? No. No, why not? What's the difference? Yes? So it's okay to look for exploits and vulnerabilities and not use them? Uh, it's I would phrase it differently. I'd say you can use them with permission. So if you have the permission of the owner of the system, so if you tell me I can use it, then I can use it. And I would, if I was smart, I'd want to get that in writing or something, right? Um, in case anything bad happens. But um, you know, hacking into your system is definitely legal. So this is why. So this is the key point. If you don't have permission, don't do it. So don't hack into a site or a system that you don't own. Anything running locally, you can go to town on. You can download 
all the open source software you want, set it up, configure it on your local machine, and you are good to go. Um, also applies to the web. Don't try to hack random websites. That's also bad. OK, everyone can nod so I can get a yes. Don't go to jail, please. I won't visit you. Sorry. Burst your bubble. OK, so what is security? Thoughts? What do we mean when we say security? Or what do we mean when we say vulnerability? Yes? Keeping private information private? So keeping private information private? Yeah. So there's actually an interesting caveat there of who decides what data should or should not be kept private, right? <coughs> so you probably have data that you want to be kept private. Would you agree with that statement? Or do you, yes, I hope so. Otherwise, maybe, I mean, maybe there is a, somebody out there who posts every single picture or everything they take to every social media account publicly, but I'd say that's unlikely. Right, so we want to keep things private that we want, and if you think of the, you think of government level, right, they have nuclear launch codes, they have the position of military bases, or of military troops, those are things they want to keep secret, so we call that confidentiality. Is that the only thing that we care about in security? Accuracy of records? Accuracy, ooh, what do you mean? So you don't want someone manipulating your data. Yeah, so um, think about maybe your bank account, right? Your bank account balance. So you probably do want to keep that necessarily secret. You don't want to tell everyone what that value is. But you'd be really upset if somebody took that value and changed it to zero. Unless it was in negatives, but you know, if it magically got changed to zero in their database somehow, and now they say you have no money, that's a huge problem, right? So we think about that as integrity. So the integrity of the data. Is there anything else? Is that the only things that are important? Yeah. Uh, accessibility of the data. Ooh, why is that important? Who cares about that? Well, if I can't access what's in my bank account, I can't exactly use it. Right. So if I if uh, Let's say I'm, at an eight, I'm about to use an ATM, and somebody else either takes down the bank so I can't withdraw my money, right? That could be an attack against security. So these are the three. It's super easy to remember. CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. So these are the things, when we think about the security of an application, these are the things that we're um, concerned about. All right, enough talking. Let's have some fun. So. I have, uh, I created a server on Amazon, um, and I have accounts for all of you, each individually. So my awesome, pwn, the awesome Pwn Devil helpers are going to distribute uh, accounts. So it's gonna use SSH. So there will be an SSH command, it'll be something like soda-blank of the usernames, one, two, three, four, whatever, at, uh, yeah, it should be, I think I'm Adam D at, Was it hack soda? Is that what I called it? Mm, yeah, hack soda. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, So yeah, raise your hand, we're happy to help. I want like everyone to get access here. So, uh, <coughs> yes. This is too close. Are these good passwords? No. Why not? It's just random text. It's is it random text? Not random, it's obvious math, math. Yeah, so it's not even random. random. All lowercase. Yeah, all all lowercase, lower yeah. So it's just for this event, right? So I just made all of these. I actually made 450 accounts just in case. You never know who's going to show up. Anybody else need a, if you need an account, raise your hand. Wait, 
arguably it's a good password, we shouldn't say it. Fine. And it's nine digits. The evidence, well, that's true. Stick the search All right, can everybody get in, get on to the server? Here are some of you. Okay, 
Okay, so first they request. So this is a shared resource, right? We're all using the same system. So availability tax are super lame, don't do it. And I have prevention mechanisms in here, hopefully, so you can't take down the system, but uh, please refrain from doing so if you can. Anybody not on the system who wants to be? There's about 70 of you. I can find this stuff out. Oop, that's not like that. About 71 people on the server. Good? All right, let's move on. So, where's... Oh, Will something someone. Good. So... How do you be an elite hacker? Watch the movie hackers. Watch the movie hackers. Watching movies will not help you. Yeah? I think like an average hacker type is on and start typing. Uh yeah. No. Going to hacker.com and randomly typing. The media will tell you you just type random things in and somehow things break. Or you make a really cool visualization of you bypassing firewalls, which also doesn't work. Brian, you said something, what'd you say? Think like a hacker. Yeah, that's part of it. So how do you think like a hacker? Be a hacker. How do you think like a hacker? Break stuff. Break stuff. It's part of it. Yeah. I didn't think of it like, has anyone ever got locked out of their house or apartment? Oh yeah. What do you what's the first thing you do? What was it? You look for an oak. You look for a way to break into your own apartment or house, right? And it's probably something you've never done before in your life up to that point. Because why would you ever think about breaking into your own apartment, right? You're, you're. I, I don't know about you, but I started evaluating like, okay, which windows are probably open? Are there any windows on the first floor that are open that I can just pop the screen off and then get open? Uh, if there's not any on the first floor, maybe like the bathroom window on the second floor is close enough to that tree, or maybe I can get on top of that uh, fence and then jimmy over and try not to kill yourself and fall. But um, So that's kind of the mindset you need to have in security when you're thinking about these things. So that's part of the hacker mindset is thinking about things and thinking about how can I break it? How can I make it do something that it was never supposed to do? Um, that's... So that's part of it. So that's definitely part of what you need. What else do you need? Tools. Tools. I'd say no. You, you can, you, yes and no uh, is, the, is probably the answer. Uh, yes in the sense that, yes, you need, I mean, you need to know what the tools are. There are what they do. No in the sense that being able to use tools alone is lame. So there's actually a term for that in the hacker community called a script kitty, which is somebody who just knows how to use a tool to, to cause havoc and damage. So that'd be like, so what your goal should be, so this is a person who like, you give them some exploit script and they can run it against a system and maybe even get access, which is kind of cool. But what's really cool is to be the person to write that script or to be the person to write the tools that you use. Um, and that's, so how do you get to that level? You have to learn how it works. I can't possibly stress this enough. Security is really just all about knowledge. Like there's nothing, computers are not magic. Has anybody ever told you that before? Maybe CPUs are, I still don't fully understand. I mean, I, have, I can draw a switch diagram or whatever, but um, how those electrons all move around and it still works. But in a computing system, from the software up, so from basically the assembly that the CPU executes, um, you need to fully understand all of that information. And that is, that really, that's really what it means when somebody calls you like, oh, you're like a leap hacker. It's not just because you can do cool stuff, it's because you know how things work to the level that you can make them do what you want to do. It's kind of like, oh God, I think, have, you, has people, have you seen the movie The Matrix? Yes. Like Neo, you have gotta be at that level where you can control things, right? You can control the matrix, you can see the matrix code in front of you when you're looking at a binary. 
And I'm not making this stuff up, but it's not easy. You don't just wake up one day and have mad, awesome hacking skills. You have to put in time and effort to understanding how things work. Uh, but when you do that, you know, literally, I firmly believe anyone can be a leap hacker. Like, all it takes is knowledge. So you all have that inside of you. I'm fired up now. What was that? I'm fired up now. Good. So let's hack. OK, so in the vein of knowledge, what happens? So has everyone coded a C program before? Most people? So what happens? So you write your C code. You want it to execute by the CPU. What happens next? Have you ever, has anybody, there are some seniors in here. Have you ever got any of these questions on an interview? Like the famous one is basically tell me everything that happens after you type in www.google.com into your browser bar and then hit enter. Tell me everything that happens. Yeah. It's actually a really good question because it's almost infinite in, in what you can get and what you can do. Um, keep, keep press interrupt driver operating system to the look up and then you have DNS and all kinds of stuff, right? So it's a similar thing that we're talking about here. So you write a C code. We've all done it. We're all guilty of writing C. And then what? You compile it. What does that mean? Can you run it? It's like a binary. What, how do you compile it? These aren't trick questions, by the way. <laughs> Just so we're clear. I'm not trying to trip, trip, trip anybody up. What was it? Does that make sense? A GCC. You use a compiler like GCC. How does that work? What is its job? What does it do? It converts C code to assembly level. So to turn C code into assembly, why does it do that? So that, so that the CPU can understand. So that the CPU can understand it. Your CPU, your processor, right? You've all seen a chip, right? It doesn't know anything about C. It couldn't care less about C. It doesn't understand C. All it understands is actually, well, ones and zeros, but you program that CPU by an assembly language. So you need a tool to translate from C code to assembly language. And then what? So you're, what is your compiler output? What was that? Something. Yes. Binary? What's an elf binary? Uh, like it's small binary? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, I can't remember what it stands for. Executable, linkable format. Executable, executable and linkable, linkable, linkable format, or ex yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yes. So, what is what? Is, so, besides the name, what actually is an ELF binary? See, this is when we start digging deep, right? This is what I'm talking about. This is that knowledge, right, of what actually happens. What is every single step that happens until that code actually executes? Yeah? Is it like, is that assembly mixed in with these, like, tags in it, like symbolic and mm -hmm. reference tags that are going to be resolved by the linker? Yes. So the it kind of depends on exactly what ELF if you have the executable format or the linkable format, executable is ready to go. Um, but basically, the way I think about it is that an ELF um, binary is the assembly code. So it's the translation of your C code to assembly, which has then been translated basically to hexadecimal, to raw bytes. And then that's essentially a file on your disk with some metadata to tell, including symbols and all these other kind of things to actually allow the operating system to execute the program. So you've done that. You've, so let's actually, you want to compile some stuff? Yes. So you probably can't type this, so don't worry about typing sudo. Um, I don't remember my password, so I'm just going to use my superpowers. So inside each of your home directories on this server, there are various C, C code. 
I think. Let's just go in order. So you can use GCC, and I'll be honest, I'm your, your GCC is lying to you. Uh, let's do calling convention.c. So you can compile it. And what does it output? A dot out. What is A dot out? How do we figure out what A dot out is? What is dot out? Dot out means nothing. So one thing you have to abandon when you use a Linux system, file extensions are meaningless, 100% meaningless. On a Windows system, this would be dot exe, which has a very specific meaning and means that it can be executed. On Linux, it doesn't matter at all. So. So how do we figure out what kind of file this is? Use the file command. Use the file command, yes. So file is a command that, so the question then is how does, how does Linux know, if I just said extensions don't matter, how does it know what things to execute and, and that it's an ELF file? Metadata, so yeah, there's actually a sequence of magic bytes in most file formats to specify exactly what type of file it is. So we, uh oh. Oh, I know why. Wait, just a second. Was your, did anybody look? Did anybody else run file? Everybody else's is working. I see. It's because you didn't re-log in. You didn't rerun back. But I don't know my password, and I don't want everyone to. Just do dot. Oh, okay, I can do. It's my. Uh, oh, it's space bash, right? Yeah, it's this. Or you can do su dash. There we go. All right. Sorry, I had to figure out why. Let's see this alias. This is live debugging, folks. Oh, see this. Doesn't work on sudo. I should use bash rc. Use sudo dash with a dash. Just compile it with the, with the. That doesn't have all the other options. It's going to be super annoying. Do you need them? Vaguely. Okay. I think you'll be fine. All right. Um, yeah, so real quick, the big. Just turn it on. The, the, again, I don't know how to use rank quotes. Uh, so the big GCC command, we're taking some liberties because this is an introduction. It just turns off some security features that might be more difficult to navigate around for an introduction to this stuff. Uh, so we're just trying to give you guys this basic platform to start off. Keep talking. Uh, <laughs> <We're safe. coughs> what? So you're safe. Oh, no. You guys really don't want that. What uh, are Oh. Oh, see? Out there we stuff. go. All right. Okay, now, oh, just to make sure, everybody compiled their stuff, right? Nobody's having problems, right? Perfect. And then you're in file on a.out? Okay, good, the correct words. Okay, we have an ELF 32-bit LSB executable. So basically, file is reading and parse, is parsing those magic bytes to figure out that it's an ELF file and then it's parsing the ELF file format to extract all of this metadata that's contained within that one file. So it's telling us so that it's a 32-bit program, which is actually pretty important, right? Do we, we want to know is it a 64-bit or a 32-bit program? Um, it is other things, talked about linking, it's dynamically linked, which means it's using libraries that are going to be loaded at runtime. Um, it, what are some of the interesting things? Uh, the not stripped at the end is kind of interesting because that means that the, somebody mentioned symbols that are in the uh, ELF file format. So that means those symbols are still there. So how do I view, how do I peek into this binary and view the assembly code? Disassemble it. GDB. Disassemble it. You, so you use GDB to debug it and get the code that way. What else? Object. What was that? Object dump? Object dump. Yeah, so there's a tool, Object Dump, which is a great tool. The other thing I'm going to highly, highly rep is using the manual. 
So this is what I think. I think there's some students from my 545 class that are super sick of me telling them to read the manual for everything, and probably also people in the pun doubles group. So I appreciated that three times today. Um, but the manual is your source of all information. If you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know how this object dump tool works that Adam talked about. Well, you just run man space object dump, and you literally get everything the developers want you to know about object dump. Every single um, option, links to other things that you can look up more information on. Uh, you can even search. So this is a VI-like interface, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you can use slot. So, for you crazy VI people, um, you can use slash to start searching. Maybe you, so you want to know how do I disassemble? Maybe you could spell it correctly first. Um, so you can see that the dash lowercase d is disassemble and dash capital D is to disassemble all. So that sounds promising. So let's do object up dash capital D a dot app. What's going to happen next? What? It doesn't matter. Pipe it to less. Pipe it to less because we want to look at it, right? It's a lot of output. So how do we know what's, what are we looking for in here? Because there's a lot of output. How do we know how to find what we want? Mains. Main, let's look for main. We can search for main. There's actually a lot of mains. So. There's a lot of other magic that you need, uh, eventually need to know about, about how does actually the main function, so you're all used to writing a main function in a C program in order to have that be the first thing that your program executes, right? I hate to burst your bubble, but that's not the first thing that executes. But there's a whole bunch of other things that actually happen first in terms of libc and the linkers and all this kind of fun stuff. So. That's why there's this underscore, underscore, libc, underscore, start, underscore, main. Um, but if you keep going, you will get to main. So then what is this stuff? Like, what are we looking at here? <coughs> x86 instructions, yes, so this is not uh, when you learn assembly, you guys, you guys learn MIPS, right? Yeah, MIPS. So some things do use MIPS, so it's useful to learn MIPS. But every single laptop in here is running x86 or x86-64. What are your phones running? ARM. ARM, yeah, so that's another one you have to learn. So actually, that uh, can be very annoying as a security person. So you have to learn all these different assembly languages. I think you would agree. Very much so. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I remember one well, one big CTF we got there, and it turns out everything was an arm. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to learn arm. And then I had spent like, the next 48 hours like reading manuals and huh. doing all that stuff. But it's much better to prepare in advance. So, um, cool. OK, so how do we interpret this output? So we said it's x86 code. So is this? 804.83cb in x86 instruction? Address what is it the address of? So what's the middle column here? Op, well, <laughs> yes and no, I would say. Is it the address of the instruction? The middle one? Oh, so let's, so on the left, what about in the middle? What's this 55? Yeah, the hex representation of the opcode push EDP, right? So on the right is the decoded instruction. So a hex value of 55, if the CPU sees that at where the current instruction pointer is pointing, that means push EDP. And 89 EF, these are not things you have to memorize, though. So this is something I should say now. So when I said knowledge, it does not include compiling things from in memory. Yes? So that 55 is a hex representation of the actual uh, like ones and zeros of the instruction, the entire instruction? Yes. OK, cool. Exactly. So and specifically, on the left, we have the address where basically part of the metadata in the ELF header says 
When you load this program into memory, make sure that at location 80483CB is the hex value 55. And make sure that at address 80483CC is, are the two hex values 89 and then E5. And you can actually verify this yourself in the fact that all these memory addresses, the delta there is exactly the size of each of these instructions. Yeah, uh, uh, just, just to clarify, by size of instruction, uh, the instruction size is not 55. Each of these uh, is a single byte, and so it's represented, in case you guys didn't know, it's represented in byte. Uh, and if you look on the, uh, or the address side, uh, what he was pointing to before the location of the uh, instruction, that is uh, four bytes long, and that's why it's a 32-bit uh, ELF binary. So what are the range, so, how many addresses can you reference in a 32-bit program? Two to the 32, right? You can go from zero all the way up to, well, FF, 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 FF. What about a 64-bit system? Yeah, a lot more, right? So that's actually the, that's the important thing to remember. The key difference between these different architectures is the size of pointers, right? A pointer is essentially an address in memory, and we know that a memory address can be four bytes or 32 bits. Yeah, that was a good point. Cool, yeah, so each of these is eight bits or one single byte in the middle, and these are the actual values there. Cool. Anything else I'm missing? Because that was good. No, I mean, I think that's, that's not yeah. all good. Cool. I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, all right, cool. So, we are going to play a game. Ooh, I like games. There's no prizes except for the prize of knowledge. Um, I know, knowledge. Um, so, if you run the score command, whoa. Ah, I did not test this with 450 people, that does work. Okay, you are all at level one, which is the first level. I guess you've cracked level zero, so good for you, you logged onto the system. Me versus the soda world, okay. So, the idea is we have, in VAR challenge, we have a series of levels, level one, level two, level three, level four. So what's inside level the level two directory? Twenty dollars for the first person that tells me in the next two minutes. What was the question? <laughs> what's inside the directory slash var slash challenge slash level two? Maybe level one to find out. Some files, maybe. Da. <laughs> good try. That was a good try. Level, level two executable. No. What's the size of the level two executable inside of the level two directory? Do I even have $20? I don't know. I'm good for it. One more minute. challenge the parent directory of level two. Yeah, so it all comes down to how access control permissions. So this is how 
I can all give you access to this server and verify that you're not going to, well, not verify, but I have some assurance that you're not going to completely crash and hose my server. Or let's say there's a um, Bitcoin wallet under var home. There's not. Don't all look at me like that. What do you think I have an answer? So uh, let's say there was one in var home Adam D, right? But I let all of you monsters onto my machine. And so what am I, what's my, um, so I'm relying on the permission system of Linux to enforce the fact that I say that nobody can view my home directory. So my home directory, if you go home out of D, you'll see that, so you gotta look at the dot directory. So, and the way, actually, well, okay, let's go back to var challenge. So the reason why we can do this is because var challenge so we have to look at the permissions on the left-hand side of ls-la. So ls-la, uh, the L is to list all files, including ones that start with dot. Is that right? Yes. No, long. No. L is long to list this output. It's the other way. And A is to list all files. Yes, there's actually a reason behind those things. So who owns the var challenge directory? Root. Root. The owner is root, so the, what is this, one, two, three, the third column is the owner of the folder, and the fourth column is the group owner of the, um, so if you run the id command, which is a good command to know, this tells you who are you. Actually, there is also a who am I, but id is much more information. So id says that I am user id Adam D, and because it's an operating system, we would refer to people by actual names, computers hate, strings and names. Uh, I just want to refer to people by numbers. So I'm number 1002 according to the operating system. And I'm in group ID Adam, I'm in, I have a group ID of Adam D. And I'm also in the groups Adam D and level one. So can you tell me what's inside for no money? What's inside the var challenge level one directory? So how can you can see this and not level two? Yeah, because the permissions of the level one directory, so if you were the challenge user, you can list, so the challenge user owns all of level one, level two, level three, level four. If you could become a challenge user, you could see into these directories because they are readable, writable, and executable by the challenge user. We're not gonna go into exactly what they mean. The dash is basically empty. So this means that a level one user is readable and executable, which means you can list the files there, but you can't go and create a new file in that directory. Go ahead and try it. You can't do it. Shouldn't be able to. Uh, even though you're a level one user. And the third, the last three dashes mean everyone else on the system. Right? So if you're not the user, you're not the group, you are effectively everyone else. All right. So then when we do ls-la var challenge level one, so how do we actually become level two? How do we get to that beautiful level two group? Exploit that one. What was that? You tricked the one executable into somehow doing something. Yeah, so, okay, a slight detour, but when I run like ls-la, what is that, what user is that running as? So every process on a Unix system is running as a user. So when I run ls, who is it running as? It's running as Adam D. If you're curious, um, you, can, you can run htop, I think, but I restricted it again so you can only see your own, uh, the, your own process running. Uh, I think I'm at the boot of a new one because I don't think I can become sudo in there without the password. Uh, you can't. And then if you, I think if you run ls and then somehow do it. Yeah, see, I don't have the password. Yeah, yeah, just like a second. Uh, I just want to show them their stuff. So I can run this as sudo. So you can see, let's see, who's my favorite? So, see, somebody, Soto132 is running VI, uh, looking at the probably the one binary. Um, 
And you can see that it's running as user soda-132. But I'm not going to get super into it, but there are things that the operating system wants to do. Uh, for instance, what's a good example? So basically, everything you run runs as your user. But an administrator may want to create a program for you to, let's say, change what shell you're using when you log in from bash to something else. So you can easily do that with the chsh program, which if we look at it, is at user bin chsh. And, for, and what this does, just a very quick overview, is this is going to add the user. One of the things it does is edit the etc passwd file. So if I, you can actually look at this. Uh, there's a lot of you. All of your shells are bin bash. If you wanted to change that, you run the chsh program, input your password, and it will alter. So can I edit the etc password file? No. Why not? Right, because I'm not root. Only root can write to this file. But if I run chsh, I can change that file. How come? Because the administrator and the thing that should tip you off, Bash is even showing you that user bin chsh is in red, that this bit, the owner execute bit, has an s instead of an x, which means that binary is set uid, which means when it executes, it's running as root. So I can show you this. I can run a user bin chsh, and then in another terminal, I can ship. Ah, stop doing stuff. Oh, no, so somebody's looking at the man page. They're looking for brownie points. Awesome. Uh, so we can see the chsh is running as root, even though I ran the program. And that's why the chsh program can edit the etc password file. So. That slight digression. Now when we look in the level one folder, what is this one binary? Yeah, so it's not set UID on the user. There's no S on the execute bit for the user, but there is an S for the group for level two. Which means when this program executes, it executes with the permissions of group two. And so what your goal is to do, uh, essentially what you need to do is to trick this executable into, to add you to the group level two. Because that's kind of annoying, I made a program called leet, which you can run. You can run it now. It's not going to do anything because you don't have a group ID. But if you trick level one into executing this leet, user local bin leet, then you will get to level two. So do it. How do you know what level one's code is? Hmm? Yeah, I gave you the C code. So look at it. No spoilers up here. Let's walk around. Oh, I do want to mention real quick. Yes that uh, just for these challenges, something that might be obvious to some people but wasn't really obvious to me when I started, uh, was that always trying to identify what your goal is with the challenge. Like in this case, our goal is uh, going to be to set the UID, to, uh, or call whatever set UID, uh, or lead in this case, uh, and try and get ourselves to the level two group. Uh, and I kind of try and work backwards from there to see what could possibly get me there. Uh, and that always helps me out, just a bit of advice. What do you do if you're reading the C code and you don't know what a function does? Man. Yes, use the man page. You can get so good, you can actually, I know this is shocking, not use the internet and Google when you're coding. Ugh. I know. It's possible. Also, guys, I'm here to help, so if you guys need help, yeah, raise just your ask. This is like an internet, this is not just running a wolf, so I'm happy to come and ask this answer to question. So, challenge. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a good point. So you may need to, when you do break the level, if you're trying to move on to level two, you need to usually log out or log back in. Because if you run ID, you'll see that you don't have the level two permissions until you log back in. But if you run score, if you run score, you'll see that you broke the level and you got you moved up.
in radio, you have to type out what's going to happen. Instruction here. What's push EVP mean? Push the, base, push, the push the base pointer. So EVP is a register. The important thing to remember is the CPU only has registers in memory. It has nothing else. There's no such thing as variables. It's all just hex, which is actually kind of nice when you think about it, because all these abstractions go away. So when we push EVP, that means there must be some value 
we'll call it the save base pointer or save EVP of whoever called us. So the first thing that we do is put save EVP on the stack. And now the stack pointer points here. And then we move the stack pointer, the stack pointer into the base pointer. So we have, uh, now we're setting up our new variables, ESP, EVP. We're gonna do some stuff. We're gonna skip over this part. And we're gonna get to the end where now we do pop EVP. So what is a pop EVP going to do with the stack pointer points here? Yeah, move the stack pointer up one and put whatever's in save EVP in this memory location into the base pointer address. Does it change this value on the stack? Does it zero this out? No. No, why would it do that? That's an insane optimization, right? Because it's going to reuse it later on. We just popped it, right? That's basically garbage. And now it's going to return. What's a ret instruction? Go back to the party. Go back to whoever called you. How does it know how to go back? Not the base pointer, because the base pointer, this saved the base pointer was already, so we have uh, base pointers are used for function frames. We'll go over that in a second. Yeah? Just the return address? The return address. So in this, what actually, we missed a step here. Before we actually started executing this function, the stack here looked like this. And actually, we cheat up here. We can see that there's this value 0xA on the stack. Above that, 0x28. And we have this call instruction to call 80483BB. What are the semantics of the call instruction? I want to say semantics. These are the things that you actually do need. You don't need to know what the bytecode version of call callee is. What you need to know is what does that actually mean? what actually happens semantically to the processor and memory when the CPU executes a call instruction. It's going to jump, so it's going to change. There's a, a EIP is our instruction pointer in x86. So that points to the current instruction. And basically, it says, set the instruction pointer equal to 80483BB. And that's how call E starts executing. What else happens? Push onto the stack the next address to be executed. So in this case, it's 80483DA is the instruction after the call instruction. So it's going to push 0x 80483DA. Oh, you were good. It's not fine. Good. So the stack pointer points to here. We then go up here, we do push EVP, all this stuff happens, we then pop EVP. The stack is going to be in exactly the same place right before the return instruction. So then what happens with the return instruction? How's there, what are the semantics of a return instruction? Not go back to the caller because it has no idea what the caller is, right? The CPU only knows registers in memory. Yes, change the instruction pointer to whatever, it's basically a pop EIP. So take wherever the stack is currently pointing, take that value, those four bytes, put them in the instruction pointer, and start executing from there. So what will happen is the stack pointer will, I can't draw that, increase, it's going to point to here, and then it's going to start executing right here. So. This is your crash course in buffer overflows. So let's create a function that when it's executing, so we'll change this callee function to have some arbitrary amount of value on the stack. And let's say there's a buffer located here at, this is the base pointer, EVP. Buffer is at EVP minus 10x. And the stack pointer is going to point all the way down here. No. Yeah. No. This is the safety EVP. Then you have the safety EVP. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Awesome. No, no, perfect. Okay, so 
How are buffers in C? Anybody written code in C with a buffer? Yes? By buffer, he means character array. Character array, also called a buffer, known by many names. So character, bracket, the size, and then the name of the variable. So what prevents you from writing 100 bytes into a character array of size 50? Can you do it in Java? Why not? Not quite because it's strongly sized. It's close. Because the runtime checks it. The runtime checks every single array access in Java checks. Is this access within the bounds? Is it greater than zero and is it less than the size? Whereas in C, there's nothing that prevents that. All you have are pointers to memory. And so there's nothing stopping you, even if this buffer is supposed to be size 10 on the stack, if you copy something of size 100, what's going to happen is the CPU is just going to start writing bytes into memory, overwriting bytes, and then what happens if it overwrites this saved instruction pointer on the stack? Does it know that it can address it? When we finally get to that return instruction in the program, that will crash the program because it's going to try to access some random bytes. What if we are incredibly clever and we've written some, what we'll call shell code, some code, and we've injected it into the process. So rather than random bytes here, we have bytes that get us a shell. So uh, as you can maybe see, I had 100 slides prepared. Our shell code is actually going to be very similar to what we wanted. It's going to call execve slash bin slash sh to get a shell. So bin sh is called the shell program. What we want to do is get a shell because that shell has those set UID permissions that we talked about in the beginning. So we can create using assembly some super cool shell code that has no null and no new lines, which will do that. And if we get that shell code, copy it into the process, and then change this instruction, this saved instruction pointer on the stack to point to wherever this memory location is, where the start of that shell code is, we can start executing code there. So basically, the next series of levels walk you through this. So if we, so you can see that. 2C actually already has the shellcode in there, so I've written that, that shellcode works. There is some address. You're trying to execute that shellcode, so it's trying to set that. So you want to execute this shellcode, which exists on the stack. So this is simulating the first part of a buffer overflow, where you have shellcode on the stack and you need to figure out what's that address that goes in there. You have 10 minutes. Do level two. You can do it. I know you can. And we'll all walk around for help.
in that address? This is what is the address? So we need to put. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll so
No, these aren't done yet. These are like coming in the future. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, eventually, we'll add more stuff here. But yeah, this goes over a lot of like much more detail and stuff than what we were talking about. Yeah. So I found out that the largest I got to put in without the other one. Yeah. 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 I put 62 in a lot of